The White Dove. Once on a cold and blustery day, a coach was travelling through the forest. It was bumping along over the ruts and through the puddles when a band of robbers ran from the trees. Your money or your lives, they shouted. As the coachman pulled hard on the reins and the coach came to a halt, one of the doors jolted open. A slim girl with brown hair managed to slip unnoticed through the door and into the trees. She ran deeper and deeper into the forest, catching her dress on brambles and losing her shoes as she went. She did not stop running until the shouts of the robbers had faded away into the distance, and all she could hear were the birds. And then she sat on a fallen log and buried her face in her hands. She was safe from the robbers, it was true, but she was alone in a deep dark wood with nowhere to go and no one to help her. Oh, woe is me, she sobbed. What shall I do? I will never find my way out of the forest. Presently through her sobs, she heard the gentle whir of wings. She looked up and saw a white dove hovering in front of her. It was carrying a tiny key on its beak. It dropped the key on the moss at her feet and said, In the tree behind it you will find a tiny lock. Open it with the key. Sure enough, hidden in the bark of the tree, and so tiny that she almost missed it, was a tiny keyhole. She turned the key in it, and a door opened to reveal a cupboard containing bread and milk. Thank you, little dove, said the girl through her tears. When she had eaten, the dove dropped a second key at her feet. That opened a tree door which led to a room just large enough to hold a bed. Sleep there and you will be safe, said the dove. The days passed, and whenever the girl was in need of anything, the dove came to her with a key, which opened yet another door and yet another tree. One day, when the dove was sitting on her hand, it said, Will you do something for me? Gladly, said the girl, stroking the dove's soft feathers. And listen carefully, said the dove. Follow the path that leads into the deepest part of the wood. It will lead you to a cottage. In the cottage you will see an old woman sitting by the fire. Do not speak to her, but pass her on her right side, and enter the room behind her. On the table you will see many rings encrusted with jewels that sparkle like fire, and amongst them one made of gold. Please bring me the gold ring. The girl followed the path and found the cottage. She could see the old woman sitting by the fire. What are you doing? croaked the old woman as the girl crept past her. The girl put her hand over her mouth so that she would not be tricked into speaking. She found the table covered with jeweled rings, but of the golden ring there was no sign. And then she saw the old woman sneaking through the door with a birdcage hidden under her shawl. The ring must be in the cage, thought the girl, and snatched it from the old woman. Sure enough, the bird was holding the ring in its beak. The girl took it gently, and then ran to the tree where her friend the dove had told her to wait. The dove was not there. She waited and waited, and still the dove did not come. She leant sadly against the tree, and her tears began to fall, as she thought perhaps she would never see the dove again. And then something very strange happened. The tree felt strangely soft for a tree, and then it seemed to grow arms which wrapped themselves around her. Do not cry, said a gentle voice. The tree was changing into a prince, and all around her other trees were changing into the prince's friends. Do not be afraid, said the prince, for of course the girl was afraid. The woman in the cottage is a witch. She cast a spell on us all. She turned us into trees. But because I am a prince, she allowed me to fly as a dove for two hours every day. He gently uncurled the girl's fingers and took the ring from her hand. When you took this from the witch, you broke her spell. And then the girl recognized the voice of her dear friend the dove, and she was afraid no longer. Like most fairy stories, this one has a happy ending too. The girl married the prince and became a princess, and they lived happily ever Thumbling. There are many stories about Thumbling, the boy who is no bigger than a thumb. All adventures have to begin somewhere, and this story tells how one of Thumbling's began. Thumbling's father was going to the forest to cut wood. I do wish someone could bring the cart to me when I have finished, he sighed. 
and I wouldn't have to come all the way home to fetch it. I'll bring it to you, said Thumbling. How can you, laughed Thumbling's father. You are far too small to lead the horse. That may be so, said Thumbling, but if Mother harnesses the horse for me, I will sit in his ear and tell him where to go. It seemed a good idea, so Thumbling's father went off with his axe over his shoulder. Make sure you're not late, he said. I won't be, said Thumbling. When it was time, Thumbling's mother harnessed the horse. Thumbling climbed into the horse's ear, and off they went. Gee up, cried Thumbling, who for such a small boy had an astonishingly loud voice. Gee up. The horse wasn't too keen on being shouted at from inside his own ear, and set off at a brisk trot. To the right, shouted Thumbling, when he wanted the horse to go to the right. To the left, shouted Thumbling, when he wanted him to go to the left. Straight on, he shouted, when he wanted him to go neither to the left nor to the right. They were almost at the place where they were to meet Thumbling's father, and they passed two men. That's very strange, said one of the men. I can hear the driver of that horse and cart, but I can't see him. Let's follow it and see where it goes, said his companion. Whoa there, shouted Thumbling when they reached the clearing. Are we in good time? I've just finished, said Thumbling's father, as he lifted Thumbling from the horse's ear. The two men nearly fell over one another in their excitement. If we had a little man like that, we could make our fortunes, they cried. We could show him at the fairgrounds. People would come from miles around to see him. We must buy him. No, said Thumbling's father when they spoke to him. My son is not for sale. Now it so happened that Thumbling felt in the right mood to start a new adventure. So he climbed onto his father's shoulder and whispered, Let me go, father. You and mother could use the money, and I will come back. You can be sure of that. So Thumbling's father, who was used to his son's ways, said the two men could take him in exchange for a bag of coal, and if they first helped him load the logs onto the cart. Where will you sit? asked one of the men, when Thumbling had waved goodbye to his father. On the brim of your hat, said Thumbling. Is he still there? asked the man who was wearing the hat every few minutes. Because he was wearing the hat, he couldn't see what was happening on the brim. We mustn't lose him. Sometimes when they checked Thumbling, was at the front of the hat. Sometimes he was at the back. Sometimes he was looking where they were going. Sometimes he was looking where they had been. Sometimes he was lying on his back, looking up at the endless blue sky. The two men walked a long way. Just as it was beginning to get dark, they sat down on a grassy bank to rest. Take your hat off, said Thumbling. Why should I do that? asked the man wearing the hat. Because it's bad manners to keep your hat on all the time, said Thumbling. And anyway, if you don't take your hat off, sometimes your head will get too hot and your hair will fall out. You could be right, said the man, and took off his hat and laid it on the grass. Quick as a grasshopper, Thumbling jumped off the brim and ran through the grass until he came to a mouse hole. Down he went. The two men were furious. Come out, they shouted. We have been tricked, they shouted even louder. It didn't matter how much they shouted, or how hard they poked their sticks down the mouse hole, Thumbling would not come out. Eventually it became too dark to see where the hole was anymore, and they had to go home without him. Now Thumbling was free to go where he wanted and do what he liked. He slept in the mouse hole that night, and the next day he went to look for adventure. It was a long time before he got home again, but he did get there in the end. He always did at the end of all his adventures. Three Masterpieces Once upon a time there was a man who had three sons. He had nothing to leave them except his house, and he could not decide which of them should have it. One house between three will not go. You cannot cut a house into pieces like a piece of cake. Finally he called his three sons together and said, You are all clever and quick to learn, so I want you to go out into the world and learn a trade. Whichever of you makes the best masterpiece, when you return home shall have the house. Very well, father, said the three sons. They agreed to come f home a year from that day, and they said goodbye and set off in different directions. The first son became a barber, 
and learnt how to shave chins. He was so quick and gentle with the razor that the most important people in the land came to him to be shaved. The second son became a blacksmith. He learnt to shoe horses so quickly he was chosen to shoe the king's horse. The third son learnt how to use a sword. He became so skillful that he was made fencing master and gave lessons to the king's young sons. At last came the time for the brothers to return home, but when they got home they were faced with a problem. They had each learned a skill that was true, but how could they use their skills to make masterpieces? The barber could shave chins, but then so could every other barber. The blacksmith could shoe horses, but then so could every other blacksmith. The fencing master could parry a sword, but then so could every other fencing master. How could they each make a masterpiece for their father? As they were standing together trying to sort out the problem, the first son, who is now a barber, and who had shaved the most important chins in the land, saw a little grey hair loping towards them. Watch this, he said, quickly making a lather from soap and water. As the little hair hopped past them at top speed, the first son, who was now a barber, shaved its whiskers off so quickly and so gently the hair did not know they had gone. That was clever, gasped his fathers. If your brothers can do no better, then the house shall be yours. At that moment, a nobleman came galloping by in his horse-drawn carriage. Watch this, said the second son, who is now a blacksmith, and who had shoed the king's own horse. Almost quicker than the eye could see, he had changed the horse's old shoes for new ones. The horse did not stumble, and the nobleman riding in the carriage did not notice anything at all. That was very clever, gasped his father. If your brother can do no better, then you shall have the house. Just then it began to rain. The third son, a fencing master, and who had taught the king's own son's defence, took out his sword and swung it round and round above his head. He swung it so quickly, not a single drop of rain could get past it. The harder it rained and rained in torrents, the, fa the faster he swirled his sword. And while all around him became wet and bedraggled, he remained as dry, as though he were standing under an umbrella. That was very clever indeed. You shall have the house, said his father, mopping raindrops from his own head. The matter seemed settled, but the three brothers had been whispering together, and now they said, If it's all the same to you, father, we would like to share the house and live in it together. And that is what they did, for after all, they had all created masterpiece. And who can say for certain, that one masterpiece is better than another. I hope you enjoyed the story today. I certainly enjoyed it.